those things, I have, does that sound better? As I stand up, my voice gets louder. That's completely my bad. Those guys do a great job. Sometimes I mess up. And so on this iPad right here, Bryce sent me something that said, turn your mic on. He could have said, turn your mic on and put words after that, but he's a very nice guy. So he just said, turn your mic on. I thought it was my bad. That will not be the last thing I mess up in the next few minutes, but I'm glad we got that one out of the way. I sat down uh, this week and I wrote down on a little piece of paper. I had a bigger piece of paper, but I wanted to put it on a little one. All of the things that I have as titles for me, like you could call not things that I've been called, that's a different piece of paper and takes a larger piece, but things that I'm called. You could say I'm a man, you could say I'm a dad, you could say I'm a husband. As I went through that list, it started, and I'm like, there's probably 10 or 12 of those, and then you keep listing, and what I realized is, for me, I was at 26, 27, and then as a matter of fact, I went and did some other stuff and thought of some more, and I have a feeling I'm not the only person that deals with that. And that's not a big deal. I'm not intimidated because you can write down a lot of titles or responsibilities, a lot of hats that I wear, but all of us have them. My struggle is what to do with all those different responsibilities and all of those different sets of expectations. Expectations from other people, from God, and then here's the crazy thing, expectations from me. Like, I'm a husband. I got married uh, a long, long time ago. I found the perfect person, as close to perfect as I could find on planet Earth when I was in college and we got married. And I'm super grateful for that. That's on my good decisions list. It's probably good to say that with you guys here. If I'd said that was a bad decision, it would have hurt my credibility for the rest of the talk. But for me, that's one of those things. But being a good husband is something I've worked at for a long time, but it is still something that requires a lot of work for me. I don't think I'm just naturally great at that. I don't know what I'm naturally great at, but not that. And so it requires effort and energy. And sometimes even when I'm doing better, I recognize that I've got a lot of room to keep getting better. Are you with me on this so far? But it's not just that. I'm also a dad. And I'm not just a dad. I'm a dad of more than one person. And so being a good dad is something that I recognize. I tried to take the good traits of my dad and repeat those. And then I've tried to fix a bunch that he didn't do well. And I hope my kids are going to do the same with me. But here's what I found out. It is tough to be both of those, good husband and good dad, because sometimes while I'm doing this, I ought to be doing this, but sometimes while I'm doing this, I ought to be doing that. And then I've got three kids, and so being a good dad to the first one may look very different than being a good dad to the second one. And both of my first two are boys, and the way we parented them is we threw balls and hit each other a lot. It's like, stop it, and you punch them, and they're like, oh, okay. That was my imitation of my sons. They'll appreciate that. But, you know, it's, we got along. We figured out. And then God gave us this amazing gift of a daughter, and it was completely different. The things that I used to do to be a good dad look completely different. I love the challenge, but it's somewhat over being a good dad there, there, and there, being a good husband. And then I've got a profession, and I take it super serious. I've done it for a big chunk of my life. I study it. I think about it. I work at it. I've tried to hone that over the years. But here's the crazy thing. To be really good at that, it takes a lot of my time, a lot of my energy, a lot of my focus. And often while I'm trying to be really good at that, I feel like I'm not being as good at this as I should be or at this, this, and this. So there's a that, this, this, and this, and that. And then I can just keep adding on more and more. And I think some of you probably deal with this. Sometimes while I'm trying to be great at my profession, my job, my living, I feel like sometimes while I'm doing that, I ought to be at home being a good husband. But this is screaming really loudly. If it doesn't get done today, the world is going to come to an end. And so this may be hurting a little bit, but sometimes when I'm doing that and I quit and then come over to this, I feel like while I'm doing that, I really ought to be doing that. And then I've got this, this, and this still to deal with. And so sometimes when I'm doing these, I feel like I'm neglecting that. And what about that? And when you put all of that together and then add in, sometimes I need to do things that are just for me. Sometimes I go, you know what I'd like to do is not do that, 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 or that, or that, although all of those are good things. I'm not choosing between bad and worse. I'm not choosing between beating up on children. I'm not selling drugs in the park to junior hires. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just choosing between good, good, and good. But sometimes I wish I could just go play around to golf or watch a movie or 
not have any responsibility and care for me. Just chill. And then there's brother and uncle and friend. I mean, how do you have friends if you don't invest in friends? And then I've got all of those. And how to balance all of that stuff is overwhelming to me. I think I stink at it. Mainly what I feel is whatever I'm doing is not enough. I should be doing more. Does, is anybody, am I the only one here today that deals with any of these issues? Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> yes, you are, idiot. Well, help me. I'll watch you and you do it well. But for me, I've struggled with it. It's not a new struggle. It's an old struggle. And so what we want to talk about really through this series and specifically today is what to do with that. Can I just add one more thing? I don't mean to be a whiner. I'm being a whiner. I don't want to be a whiner. I hate it when people are whiners. But when you take all of that and then you go to church and at church, you know what they say? You need to do some more stuff. You ought to be a part of a group. You ought to come on Sundays. You ought to open your Bible. You ought to spend time with God. You ought to pray. You ought to worship. You ought to, and I'm like, that, 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 and that, and that, and then that, 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 and then I've got all of those things. And then emotionally and spiritually, and then I open my Bible, the book with so many words, and just in this one Bible, this one little library that we put in leather-bound covers, In the Old Testament alone, there's over 600 commands of things I ought to do. 600 more. Because I wasn't struggling with that, 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 and that, and that, and this. 600 more. And I'm like, well, that's the big part of the Bible. And then I get to the smaller part in the New Testament, and there's over 1,000 commands. Now, a few of them are duplicated, but anyway, you look at it, there's like 1,500 more. Because I was doing so well with the first ones. And then sometimes I just go, dude, I am never going to get all of that right. I can't get most of that right. And I think it's why some of us sometimes go, just forget it. No matter what I do, you know what it's going to be. One more thing, one more thing, one more thing. You'll never be good enough. And if you've ever dealt with, if if you are like, I've never dealt with any of those things. Man, I wish I were you. And you're a liar. All at the same time. Well, if you've ever dealt with that, this series is, is really intended to help. Let me give you a couple things. I've been reading a book for, for the last few years, and I've come upon it again lately. It's kind of part of what we've built this series around, and it's called Love Does. It's by a, by a guy by the name of Bob Goff, and Bob basically just tells in like 31 little short story-oriented chapters how he is learning to live out love in his life. Now, we have a few of them. We've, we've, a lot of you guys have jumped in on this train as we're kind of reading this book together. And so we've had them for sale out there. I think there may be three or four more. And then we also have one for kids. And if, uh, if you want somebody who's wanting to invest some special in their kids, this would be a great idea for you to read along with them. And I started reading, and Bob, uh, he's just amazing in the stories he tells. And his life just seems so insane, but he is such a beautiful example of what love looks like. And under each chapter, there's a little statement that he makes, I used to think. And so I've kind of stolen his idea with I used to think, and I've got four of those. I'll give them to you uh, as we go through this. I'll give you the first one, and it has to do with this balancing of everything. I used to think I had to figure out how to balance everything, all these things. But now I know that doing one thing right will lead to finding all of the rest finding their place. I used to think I had to balance everything and do it all right. And what I figured out is sometimes doing one thing right will bring the rest into place. Now, I like to play golf. I'm not a golfer. The way I know is I watched TV and I saw a golfer, and he didn't look like me. That's how I figured out I'm not one of those. But I like to play golf, uh, and that counts as something. Um, One of the things I found out, there's like 8,000 if you ever tried to learn to play golf, especially from somebody who thinks they're good at it. They will tell you things, and in every move you make, they'll tell you that's wrong. Because there are a lot of moving parts. They're going to talk to you about about posture. They're going to talk to you about how your arms swing, how your hips turn, how your feet rotate, your weight, all of those things. They're going to talk about backswing and follow through. They're going to talk about all of these. And now, if you're watching professionals, they're going to talk about launch angle and club head speed. It's like, but here's what would happen if you went and just got lessons from a professional. The first thing they would do 
is they would say, first, I want you to grab the club, and they would ask you to take it, and then they would work on one thing. They'd work on your grip, because if you don't hold the club right, none of the rest is going to matter. If you grab it like it's a hockey stick, unless you are Adam Sandler, that is never going to play well for you. What they would say is, this will not make everything perfect, but without this, nothing ever will be. If you don't get this piece right, you're not going to win at the rest of it. And I guess what I would like to say today is if we can get the most important thing right, other things have a chance. But if we don't get the most important thing right, I believe that we're going to struggle forever. Now, Jesus, when he came to earth, he came in flesh to kind of show us what life is supposed to look like. He was sort of a, a uh, watch this. He, you know what he was? He was YouTube before YouTube was cool. Because now when I don't know how to do anything, I just watch a YouTube. How to, how to build a, a, you know, a bomb. YouTube. How to fix your spark plug, or how to change your spark plugs, how to fix your brakes. I'll just watch a YouTube. Well, before there was YouTube, there was a hymn tube. And he just came and said, watch. I know what God is like because he and I are one, and I will come and show you. And so he did, even when he was a little kid, one day they were leaving from something and his mom couldn't find him. And it works that way here a lot. You know, some of you leave and come back and it's like, I left one of my kids. And you would think we would judge you, but all of us who had more than one kid have probably done it sometimes accidentally. <laughs> no judgment there. But he left and his parents couldn't find him. They look all around. And when they finally found him, not smart aleck E, if that's a word, his mom said, oh, I'm so glad we found you because that's what you do and your kid's been missing. Oh, and you hug them, and then that's over. And then you do the, what were you thinking? What's the matter? And I don't know how you do that with a son of God who is perfect, but I bet she tried it because, you know, parents. What were you? And we looked over there, we looked over there, and somewhere in that, I think he must have softly said, I would have thought you would have known where I was. Why? And here's his statement because I just have to be about my father's business. It looks like at 12 years old, he knew why he was here. This whole balance, did he have a little pressure? He was the son of God. He was going to save and redeem the world. He was a brother, a son, a savior. I mean, he had a few hats to wear in his day. And he seemed to get it at 12. As a matter of fact, over and over, he said, you know, people go, well, how do you do that? Hey, he said, I just do what the father tells me. I just go where the Father sends me. I just say what the Father wants me to say. He seemed to have this balance of knowing exactly what was the next thing to do and doing it well. It brings me to my second I used to think. I used to think that Jesus made it look so easy because he was just that God. Like, well, of course he did it well. He's God. That's cheating. I would do it well. Some, some, you met some people who think they're God. Listen, he was. Well, of course he does it well. He's just God. But now I know he was just always focused on keeping the main thing the main thing. The reason so many things fell into place is he knew what was most important. And so if I knew what was most important, I could do better too. And what would straighten up the 80 things in my life is having the one thing in the right place, and that's kind of the purpose of our whole series. I'm not the first to struggle with this because there were a bunch of guys, a bunch of people that followed Jesus and hung out with him when he started talking, and I think some of them, they didn't have like leather-bound versions, but they had a few of the books, and they were in big, long scrolls, and they were like, there's so many words and so few pictures. There's so many you betters and you better nots, and I know when you're sleeping, and I know when you're awake. There's just so much what do you do with all of it? Is there like a short version? Is there a video? Is there like notes on it to Jesus? They asked that question. It's pretty much what they said. And Jesus answered them because he's super nice. I would have said, just read the book. It's what my, you know, if you don't know how to spell it, go get a dictionary. That's before, you know. But Jesus didn't say that. He said, all right, I'll do it for you. He said, here's what I want you to do. There's all of that out there, and I know it's overwhelming, and there's all these hats to wear. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God. Oh, yeah. Another one that fits right there is like 1 and 1A. And love the people around you. 
Thank you. Have a good night. Tip your servers. Thanks for being here. The end. I have a little sign in my office and I put it where I can see it. Everywhere I have an office, I put this in it. And the reason is not because it's so decorative. It's because I struggle with this so much. It sums it up this way. It just says, love God. Love people. The end. Well, I think you may be oversimplifying a little bit. No, you don't think I may be oversimplifying a little bit. Jesus is the one who oversimplified it. Well, Chris, but what about, don't argue with me. He wrote the book. If you don't like it, take it up with him. I would have written something that took 18 million more words and was confusing. He said, I'll summarize all of the law and all of the prophets and everything before and everything that's going to come. Love God wholeheartedly and love people. Why don't you get good at that? And everything else will find its way. Yeah, but what about, I know, that's what I say. But what about, but he didn't just stop saying it there. As a matter of fact, all through scripture, he keeps going back to this point. And here's where I struggle. I had this talk and I love this talk and I love this book and I love this study. And then I get to a point this last week and I read this passage and it all quit being fun because I don't like some of the Bible. Parts of it I like, I just think it's amazing. Some of the parts I like you think are boring probably, but there's some of it I just go, I just don't like the way it says that at all. And I thought we could try to remove it, but evidently you're not allowed. So I'll just read it to you and see what you think. It starts out because it's about to say something really rough. So before you say something really rough, sometimes you start, it's like a a compliment sandwich. And you say, oh, you're really awesome. Do better. Oh, but you're awesome. A compliment sandwich. This verse, it starts this way. Dear friends, isn't that nice? About to punch you in the face. But before we start, what up? Everybody, wow. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. See how well this is working out? It's like love. It's all about love. Just love. Come on, everybody, love. And then it just keeps going. But anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Sometimes we say these kind of things. Well, they're really hard to love. You know anybody like that? That was a stupid question, wasn't it? There's somebody that pops into your mind, and here's the crazy part. You may pop into somebody else's. Some of you right now are saying it about me, and that hurts. He doesn't say try to love. He doesn't say you ought to love. He actually says this, if you don't love, then the love of God is not in you. You can spew your verses. You can wear your Christian swag. You can go to the tent on Sunday. But if you don't love, you're posing. You're playing games. I don't like that part. Because sometimes I love well, but sometimes I just have a hard time loving at, at all. The reason is because some people are just so difficult to love. He goes on, he said, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And so it's right after he punches us right in the stomach and you're trying to recuperate, he goes easy on us again. It's like, you say you love, but if you don't love, it's not because you're not trying hard. It's because the love of God's not in you because if the love of God is in you, you will love. And then he goes, that hurt, didn't it? Well, you know, God loved you. And he gave his son because that's what love looks like. And then he finishes with his statement because God actually, he said these words, God is love. He didn't say God loves. He didn't say God does love. He said God is love. If you cut God open, you know what you'd find love. You know why he loves? Because he is love. He can't not love. You know why he loves people that I don't love? Because he can't not love people. Because he is love. You want me to tell you the example? If you ever get those Easter chocolate things, bunnies, there's two kinds. There's the good kind and the satanic kind. 
The satanic kind looks like a great bunny. And then you open up that little box and you pull that little thing out and then you break it in half and you know what's inside? Air, air. I didn't want air. I want a chocolate bunny. God don't love that. Why would somebody do that? You know what it is? Fake bunny. We're celebrating, nothing celebrates a risen Christ like a solid piece of milk chocolate. But not just air. I guess it represents an empty tomb but not very well. <laughs> I think for many of us, on the outside, we look like we're all that sweet, but on the inside, we're a little bit empty. And you know why God loves you and me, even though we don't deserve any of that? It's because he can't. It's not because we're good enough. It's because when you break him open, he is solid through and through love. He is just love. And when he comes into our life, that is what he intends to make you and me. He wants all of the words in the book of many words to be a part of our life, but the way all of them become part of our life is through love. It is the bottom line. Love God, love people. Leads me to the third, I think, or I used to think. And this is a tough one because sometimes I look at what Jesus did because he loved, and it gives this beautiful example. It said, well, what he did because he loved is gave his life. Well, I'm not that good. I love you, but I'm probably not going to die for you. I'd, I'd help you out the door. I'd, I've given, this week, I gave somebody five bucks right out of my pocket. I didn't have five extra bucks, but they needed it worse than me, and I just gave it to them. Then part of me hoped they did something good with it, and then part of me said, shut up, just love well. Because I was studying this. Sometimes I do loving things, but I'm just telling you I don't care on my best day. I'm probably not going to die for you. He gives this example, and it's so over the top. And then we read Love Does, and one of the things when you read it, you're going to find this guy's just nuts. He does the craziest things in the world, and I used to think it was just bogus. And then I got to know a little bit more about him, and then I met him, and then I've been a couple places he was, and I know some people who know him. And all those people say, this guy, his influence in my life has changed the way I see life, has changed the way I see God. He's just so over the top, but then I look at my life and go, my life doesn't compare to that. It seems like the things I do that are loving are so small. I used to think this. I used to think that we're supposed to do small things with great love because I read it on a sign that used to be in our bathroom. So I had time to read it. And so I would look at it, and every time I look at it, I would think I got to do better. Small things with great love. But now I'm beginning to learn that there are no small things done with great love. Because with great love, there is no small thing. That great love, anything that comes after that, is a great thing. And the way you tell superheroic stories is you spend your life doing seemingly small things and God multiplies those things. That if you were to look at Bob Goff's life, you would find out that he tells his highlight reel. It's a little like social media. But the truth is, if you talk to his wife and you talk to his kids, they would say for every one you read about there, he just did that every day. If you talked about the people who worked with him, they would say that's just the way he lives out every day. And most of his love actions aren't over the top. They seem like simple things. They're just done with great love. Therefore, they're great things and they just lead to more things. And so if we were going to get to the bottom line, the bottom line would be this. There's like 1,500 commands and a whole lot of expectations and a whole lot of roles, but if we could just do this thing of love well, then we'd win. And our community would win. What if the churches in West Tennessee were just known by one thing? If you just talk to the people all through our community who don't like the whole God deal and religious deal or whatever we want to call it. And if you just said to them, what is it that frustrates you most about church or better yet? Because they'll all tell you that without you asking. If you were to say, what do you like most? Wouldn't it be great if every one of them said, I don't like a bunch of church stuff and I don't like a bunch of religious stuff, but I tell you what I do. Those people just love and care for each other. That's just crazy. I watch the way they care for each other and their families. I watch the way they treat our community. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want to go to church, but that is compelling. It's hard for me not to want to be a part of that. When I watch, I'm just like, boom, I wish I had some of that. Wouldn't that be great? Unfortunately, some of us who wear the tag, the, 
the most boldly, the people around us would seldom know that love is the common denominator. So when I was in high school, I took Spanish because they said you had to. And for a while, I could count in Spanish. I seldom found a need to, but if I'd had a need, I could have counted some stuff right up. I could also find the bathroom and order at Taco Bell, do a few other things. We started doing youth work years ago, and we took uh, some of our teens to Mexico every year, and all of them would be like, oh, this will be great. I get to practice my Spanish. I've had Spanish one and two. And then they would get there, and somebody would start speaking, and they would go, I don't know what he said. Where's the bathroom? You know, that was their Spanish as well. I'm not a good language learner. And then I moved my family to East Africa. We lived in Tanzania. We had to learn Swahili. Swahili is Spanish on steroids. The problem is I talk all the time. I talk to talk. I say I have too many words. And then I'm in a place where I don't know any. I was about to explode. I was like, I got to find words. So we went to a language school. One of the things I figured out, it was easier to learn it if you were immersed in it. You know what? If you were going to speak, you were going to speak Swahili because then nobody was talking anything else. It's all you heard. It's all you read. It was everywhere. And so I learned a lot more quickly. And so I got better at it. I could stand up on a Sunday morning and speak in Swahili. I could carry on conversation. I could go to the bank or go to the store and I could speak Swahili. I wasn't great at it then either, but I got a lot better. Then I had a friend named Dave. I liked a lot of things about Dave, but this one thing I didn't like about him, he spoke Swahili better than Swahili speakers spoke Swahili. I mean, he was like chalky white, but like Tanzanians would go to him to say, how would you say that in Swahili? That's how good his Swahili was. I didn't mind that he knew so much more than me. It just made me look that much worse. When he would speak and then I would speak, people would go, you ought to hang out with that guy more. So he spoke it so well, some would say he was fluent in Swahili. Fluent is a weird word. I don't know for sure what definition fluency has. The way somebody taught me is when you're fluent in something, it means you actually can begin to think in that language. Now see, the way I thought was this. I would think of God loves you. And then I would try to bring up all the vocabulary words I had learned in Swahili and then try to figure out how to build those into a sentence, and then I would say it. But sometimes it would look like the thing that spins when you click on something on your computer or your phone. I had that look a lot. I would go, Mungu Anakupinda. People would go, oh, he said it. But it just took a while. And then sometimes when I finished saying that, I would have to go like this. Again, not Dave, man. He thought in Swahili. He thought it and it came out it became so natural to him that it wasn't such an exercise anymore. Can I just ask you, when it comes to your world, not your language you speak out loud, but the way you live, what are you fluent in? This is where I quit enjoying this study because I was going to help you guys get better at this thing of love. And what I realized, sometimes what I'm fluent in, this was my little study, is I'm pretty fluent in criticism sometimes. I don't even have to think. I can look at people and instead of noticing their potential, instead of noticing what God could do in them, instead of noting what we have the same, I notice what's different about them. And sometimes I just pick it apart. You know why? Well, sometimes God's love that's supposed to be so resident in me, I have pushed way down inside. I hate that about me talking to somebody this week and they said you know what I hate and I didn't say it because I'm probably not that guy but what I thought inside was no I don't know what you hate and I don't care does anybody need to know what I hate you know what I don't like about that guy no and you don't need to know why is it we're so quick to tell people that you know what I hated about that movie no and I don't need to I can figure out bad about people, about things. You don't have to help me. Wouldn't it be great if we were just so fluent in love that we saw the potential in humanity? 
the ones that look like us and the ones that don't look like us, if when we looked at other people, we saw what God sees, and that's what their potential could be with him. Wish I were better at that. And here's what I figured out. I've been trying this a long time, and I'm not going to get better accidentally. I'm going to have to purposely take some steps to become good at that. And if I want to balance my that and this and this and this and that and this and all of those, then I'm going to have to somewhere figure out how to get this one thing right. I'm going to have to become an expert. I'm going to have to become fluent in how to love. And that's why we kind of started this whole series. To say, not you oughta, you better. God said, but to say, I bet if we all work together, we could get better at this. I just bet if we all kind of linked arms, we can improve. And instead of looking back saying, yeah, we should have done that years ago, we could just say, I'm not perfect, but man, we're moving forward. And as a church, it just makes me wonder if we couldn't make a big difference in the world we've been put in. And so we're just asking people, if you would do this, if you grab a book, if we don't have them out there, go to Amazon. You can download it in about 30 seconds. They're 10 bucks. Grab an Audible. If you don't like to read, get an Audible. Just listen to a chapter a day is all it takes. It takes literally 10, 15 minutes a day for almost any of the chapters, even if you don't read really quickly. But don't just read it as a thing so we can talk about a guy who wrote a book. Read it and be inspired that it might make you do better. And then here's what the big ask for you is. That you would say to God every day, and this is a challenge, and I, Jeremy every week says, here's the next step. When I speak, sometimes I just don't do those things. Sometimes I do. And some of you won't do this, but I'm just saying, if you want to move forward in this most important thing, this would help. Every day when you wake up, would you just say to God, God, if you would somehow show me a way to show love today, if you just give me an opportunity, I'll do it. Just invite, ask. And then as you do it before you leave the house, and then as you leave through the day, would you watch and listen for an opportunity to show love? And it may be something that would be almost unnoticeable by someone else. It may be something so small that doesn't seem great, but anything done in love is great. And the habit of doing, of asking and watching and then doing, that's the third ask, watch and listen and then do is actually what life with God in it looks like. Is that over? It's what Jesus said, I just watch and do what he wants me to do. I just listen and do what he says to do. All I do is I say, God, what? And he tells me and we do it. And I don't think that usually happens out loud. If you'll look around before you get to lunch tomorrow, you will find an opportunity. I promise, you know why? Because for the last three or four weeks, every morning I've gotten up before I left the house, say, God, if you'll show me one way today, I'll do it. And every time I pray that, he does. And some of the time I do it. I just want to challenge you. If the love of God is in you, fight for this thing. Don't underestimate. One of the things that we found that people want to move forward is usually they do it together. And so we started some groups, and it's not too late. You guys have done an amazing job jumping into groups. We've got a few with spots still open. They all start this week. And so if you would jump into one of the groups, if you haven't done that yet, if you went out here, you can go on ourjourney.news and you can look at where those are. If you'll go right out here to this little desk, this little connection uh, area, we'll have someone that'll help you do that and give you an opportunity to jump in together. Because typically what's important to us, we set aside time and focus. But I'm just telling you, if every day you would ask, watch, listen, and do and you would jump in to do that. And we've got a couple of other opportunities we'll lay out next week. Don't underestimate what God could do in your life. And with all the things we've got to get our balance around, I'm just telling you, this is the core. And if you never do this right, those will never work. And if you get this one right, you may be shocked how much more simple the book with many words will become. Because when Jesus summarized the whole thing, he just said, love God and love people the end. So God, help us. Help us not be experts at talking about what's wrong in the world. Help us fill up social media this week by spotting what other people are doing well. Just spotting other people who are loving their kids well, or loving their family well, or loving their community well, or people who are just showing love to those around them. Help us just fill up our world by looking for good, by doing good. Help us not be the ones who whine about what is broken, but be a part of the process of fixing it. And if we do that, the love of you must be in us, and we'll celebrate that together. Amen.